From the very beginning, I thought, you can't go wrong. I said, I thought biochemistry, so biology and chemistry, and then aging, great science question, but also great potential for, for medicine. So I, I really felt there was just nothing else that could beat this, at least in my view. Hello and welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. I'm Peter Bowes. This is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Well, today, a return visit to the podcast by Dr. Walter Longo, Professor in Gerontology and Biological Science and Director of the Longevity Institute at the University of Southern California, USC, here in Los Angeles. Walter is the creator of the Fasting Mimicking Diet that I've referred to many times on this podcast over the past year. He is the author of a new book, The Longevity Diet, which tells the story of Walter's journey from Italy to California, from music to biochemistry, and from a typical American diet that he encountered in Chicago to the plant-based regime that he now follows and encourages the rest of us to take up. Walter, it's good to see you again. Good to see you, Peter. Our last conversation ended with a quick reference to the fact that you were about to turn 50. Now, that's happened in the last few months. I'm just curious, for anyone, for someone who's spent a lifetime thinking about longevity, was that a, a milestone that was particularly significant to you? I don't know that I, I would call it a milestone, but uh, certainly, um, you know, I, I, I hate to have that label, and now I got it, so... Um, I wasn't uh, too happy about it, but uh, <laughs> it's okay. You know, I, I, I live with it. And, uh, well, you hate it. Don't you embrace it, knowing, especially you of all people, knowing what you know about the potential for, for longevity? No, I, I, I never liked the, this, uh, this clock on life, you know, and, and the fact that you are treated based on your chronological age. Uh, I think it's terrible, and I, I think at some point we'll remove it from... Uh, uh, you know your birth date uh, and and using that to to judge people really and 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 determine how they should act and and what they should do et cetera et cetera so i think it's uh it's an old uh i understand that that, that this has been the way we've done it for a long time but uh i think at some point it may be good to to go more about with biological age certainly and uh and with just the way um you know somebody uh, is you know. Well, we can talk a bit about that. Before we go any further, I should say that we have talked at length before. We've done a lot of interviews. The first episode of this podcast covered a lot of what you write about in the book. So if anyone listening wants to listen to, I suppose, part one, it is episode one. You can go to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast website. That's uh, llamapodcast.com. Listen to the first interview. We might skirt around some of the issues that we talked about first time and try to cover some new ground here. So let's Talk about the book and why you decided to write it. And I noticed that you, you say in the book that you postponed writing the book for quite a long time because you wanted to be sure that your recommendations caused no long-term side effects. So you, you, you clearly got to that point that you were very comfortable with what you were doing before you wanted to share it. Yes, so I wrote the book 10 years ago and uh, I got very close to publishing in Italy and then I just stopped. And it was finished, pretty much. And, and I, I think one of the reasons why I stopped was that I felt that there was a lot missing in terms of epidemiological studies, studies of centenarians, clinical studies, etc. So, yes, I, th I thought it was a great idea to postpone. And now, I, instead, I felt the opposite. I felt that it was just a bad idea to keep postponing it because, of course, you can never get to complete certainty but the but the data, our own data, but also the the data from many many laboratories and hospitals that I collected was overwhelming, and I just felt, uh, uh, you know, in the worst scenario, this will do good to you. And you are really your own guinea pig, aren't you? You you live the story yourself, and in in a sense, you've seen your own personal results. Yes, I I always, of course, that's uh, that's key. And uh, not just myself, but my my, uh, my family, my colleagues, uh, the half of the department here, 
uh, my students, I mean, I, I certainly don't tell them to do it, but I think a lot of people are, are, are doing it, are adapting uh, what we're doing. Yes, in my case, my blood pressure started uh, becoming high, and my cholesterol uh, was high, and, you know, already when I was around 30, I was on my way to uh, be on multiple drugs, and um, it, this runs in my family. So it made sense. In, in that there was a genetic uh, factor, but I certainly didn't want to be on drugs, essentially. And, and uh, you know, particularly because I knew that you know, most drugs in the long run will have side effects. And, uh, and many drugs in the long run were not, are not going to really be effective. Uh, they may help you with something and, and hurt you with something else. And, and so this is why uh, I started adopting my own. And, of course, I was a, a student at Roy Walford. Uh, back in in graduate school, and uh, you know Roy was one of the nutrition and longevity pioneer, probably the nutrition and longevity pioneer in the planet. So it was a good place, and and you know he certainly was using diet to control his cholesterol and his blood pressure, etc. Uh, the problem with uh, with what he was doing was that I think it was calorie restriction, and it was also good and bad like drugs, and it was just a matter of figuring out you know how, how do you keep the good and eliminate the bad. Are you completely off drugs now? You don't take any hypertension medication or anything like that? I never took any drugs. Yeah. Oh, so you never even started. You, you're getting to the point where you might have done. Well, I was getting to the point where I had to do it. My blood pressure was 140. And my cholesterol like, it was way over 200. Uh, yeah, so any doctor will have put me on. Uh, in fact, they told me, uh, you, you're going to have to go on, on statins and, and blood pressure medication. My mother has been on blood pressure medication for... Uh, Decades, my brother is on blood pressure medication. So, yeah, so that was uh, the option. You just mentioned, just that I want to delve more deeply into the fasting mimicking diet and, and other aspects of the book, but you just mentioned your family, and there's a nice story about your father in the book. And he is at a great age now. He has suffered some health problems, but at a great age, he's started to eat chocolate. Yes, so, uh, and this uh, actually, I, I wrote my second book in Italy, but and as part of the second book, I went around uh, Italy and really visited, you know, all the centenarians, all the people that had record longevity and uh, from all kinds of regions. And I really like this uh, group of people, in which includes my father, that um, basically finds, uh, you know, in a very advanced age, finds this pleasure in simple things like chocolate. I couldn't eat it all these years, and now I'm just going to go ahead and have it. And, um, you know, and then in addition, they also find pleasure in the competition of feeling like they, and this I saw with uh, Salvatore Caruso, who was one of the oldest uh, person in the world, uh, 110, up to a few years ago. And this competition about, you know, record longevity, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm still alive, I'm still going, so now I'm going to eat chocolate and drink wine and, and try to go for the record. You know, and, and that's really uh, actually more common than you would think among these um, you know, people that make it to very old ages. So it's, it's the feel-good factor to some extent. You have, I mean, he has reached a, a great age. So it's partly, you think, being just happy and enjoying life that is keeping and going to some extent? Yeah, I think it's finding, is uh, re- reconsidering uh, maybe the things that make you happy and realizing that um, you can be happy um, by also focusing on simple things and focusing on uh, on the competition. You know, I'm, I'm still here. A lot of my friends and people that I knew are not alive anymore. And, and all of a sudden, you realize that that's, a, uh, uh, that's something to be positive about. That's something to be uh, happy about. And... Um, uh, yeah, so and together with the, the little things, uh, it just gives you the strength to not only go on, but maybe go on in a, in a positive way. So as I say, it is in part a, a personal story about your journey from Italy to the United States. You came here as an aspiring rock star, as a, as a musician initially, and I think that's what took you to Chicago. You were very definitely, at that point in your life, you did want to be the, the, the rock star. I was interested in your observations about people, and especially your family in Chicago, and that's really your first encounter with the typical American diet and how it was affecting your Italian relatives? Yes, so my uh, Italian relatives, and, and most of them were 100% Italian, so genetically 
Um, they were uh, just like everybody back in southern Italy. And, and a lot of them were developing uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Um, and so um, I thought there w- this was not really, I don't remember anybody in Italy having the same problems. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was just at the time I didn't think much of it, but certainly I thought uh, strange why all of a sudden all these relatives are getting these problems, which uh, um, were not very common in, uh, in my family back in Italy. At that point, music was your focus, but you had had this interest in longevity, I think, since being a child, observations of older members of, of your family. But it wasn't until you got into Texas and you started studying music that something, something clearly happened in, in your mind to think, look, I can't make a career out of music, but studying longevity and seeing how we can live longer and better there's a goal there. There's an aspiration there that you really wanted to achieve. Yeah, so I, I think I was just waiting for an excuse uh, to go do what I wanted to do. And uh, for the longest time, I, I, music was what I told everybody I was going to do. And, and and I love music, and I played for many, many more years. Uh, I still do. But uh, I think longevity and, and uh, aging was uh, what I was very interested in doing. And so uh, I, I, when they asked me to uh, direct a marching band, <laughs> that was my excuse to get out. And I said, you know, I'm not going to do that. Um, I can't see you doing that. Yeah, yeah it was not going to happen. And, um, yeah, so that, that really pushed me to, to, uh, to do this. And I, I just, from the very beginning, I thought, you can't go wrong. I said, I thought biochemistry, so biology and chemistry, and then aging, you know, great science question, but also great potential for, for medicine. So I, I really felt there was just nothing else that could beat this, at least in my view. Okay, so let's talk about some of the detail in the book. And you spell out quite early on in the book your five pillars of longevity. Can you just explain to me what the thinking is behind those five and, and how they apply to how we can live our lives, uh, what the longevity diet is? Yes, yeah, so the, the five pillars, of course, I read a lot of books uh, about diet and, and longevity or, or diet and disease. And, uh, and what I think was clearly missing, I thought it was a lot of one pillar books, right? So it may be somebody that was a doctor and said, oh, uh, I had a lot of patients in my career and uh, here's my diet. And that's one pillar, right? And, and, um, and, and, or it could be somebody that was an epidemiologist. So they looked at a lot of population studies, and here's my diet. And I thought that, you know, this is a very good way to get it right and wrong at the same time because you can interpret uh, one pillar results in many, many different ways. And so it was very important to have a method first. And the method, in my case, it was based on five pillars and really think very hard about, you know, what is it that will make this difficult to fall apart. And so it was clinical trials. First of all, basic research uh, based on, uh, focused on longevity. Then clinical trials, then epidemiological studies, uh, studies of centenarians, and studies of a complex system, either as a car or a plane, uh, you know, age. And so I thought that if you put it all together and you basically start going through each one of these and say, okay, my idea, for example, a low-protein diet. Well, let's look around. Okay, what about the basic science? Check. Definitely low-protein diet over and over and over, whether it's a, it's a mouse or, or a worm or a yeast, it works. Extends lifespan, et cetera. And then there was the molecular mechanism. How does it extend lifespan? Well, okay, we know that. And then you say, well, what about epidemiological studies? Well, you go out there and you say, well, overall, I mean, you're not going to always get 100% confirmation, but overall, the low-protein diet are, you know, uh, associated with long lifespan. And then, you know, clinical trials is not really yet there, but certainly clinical trials were showing proteins lowering IGF-1 and IGF-1 and TOR. If you have less protein, you have less IGF-1, less TOR. That was confirmed also at the clinical level. So, you know, most people will say, okay, this is... And also we had the people in Ecuador that had low 
IGF-1. And so they were like people that never ate proteins. Just jumping in quickly for, for people maybe who haven't heard what we've done before, IGF-1 and TOR, can you just give me a quick explanation of, of their significance and what they are? Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll just summarize it like this. A few years ago, we did a workshop uh, with all the top world top experts in Sicily and uh, on, on genetics of aging. And, um, you know, the number one and two uh, genes or, or pathways that were uh, voted to be the most clearly associated with aging were IGF-1, growth hormone IGF-1, and the Taurus kinase pathway. So it was almost a unanimous uh, agreement that, yes, these are clearly accelerating the aging process, and they're conserved in, in doing so. And IGF-1 is insulin-like growth factor 1. It is a, a growth hormone. It's a, it's a growth factor, and it's a growth factor that is uh, clearly responsible for much of the growth of a person, uh, during the development years, uh, it also is responsible for the cellular growth. You know, when you try to uh, generate it or push cells to divide and grow, that is one of the key uh, factors involved. So, yeah, so that was the, that pillar. And then, of course, the, um, uh, the centenarian studies, I thought it was really, really important for safety because, uh, um, you know, let's say that you come up uh, with, uh, for example, the very popular high-fat uh, high protein diets, right? Low carb. Now that, that you hear everywhere. Well, if you go around the world, whether it's Okinawa, if you go to around the world to the record longevity area, Okinawa, Costa Rica, uh, Greece, Sardinia, Calabria, etc., Loma Linda, you don't see that. You know, none of them have that diet. And so, even though, and of course, the, that diet is not supported by almost any of the pillars. But let's say even if you had a couple of pillars that, that support it and say, well, the high protein, high fat diet makes mice live longer, which is not true. But let's say that you had that, then you know if, if you don't have the uh, the centenarian uh, uh, part, then you have to wonder, uh, is this a good idea or not? And so this is why epidemiology is so important with longevity studies because longevity by its very nature makes it very difficult to do long very long-term clinical trials so you need to make observations of, of people and communities in different parts of the world living under different circumstances and then pulling all the threads together and looking at the the common factors that in many cases just leap out at you yes you you have it's it's very very i mean you can do a, it was done for monkeys and that was already uh, an ach a big achievement uh, in the last 25 years, you know, the studies on longevity of monkeys. Um, but uh, it cannot be done for, for people, obviously. Um, so, so you have to do it uh, by uh, having multiple, uh, uh, multiple pillars and, and uh, really uh, extrapolate from that. And, and, you know, by the time you get to the five pillars, you get a pretty good sense of what's uh, good and, and, and what's bad. Okay, let's delve into what the longevity diet is. What is the, with all of your research experience and, and personal experience as well, can you describe the lifestyle? You've mentioned low protein, but there are, there are other factors as well. How uh, do you apply a longevity diet and, and how does fasting mimicking fit into that? Yeah, so then, then the, um, the longevity diet, uh, I mean, the everyday diet and the fasting mimicking are, are two separate things. And in fact, uh, the better the diet, the, the everyday diet that someone has, the least you have, you have to do the fasting making diet. But I put them together because I, I really felt uh, after this you know, close to 30 years of work that I've done on, on aging, uh, actually 30 years now, I think I started in 1988 with uh, Robert Gracie at, uh, at, in Texas doing aging research. So I felt that uh, the FMD, the fasting making diet, is very important because a lot of people uh, don't want to change the diet. So what is the everyday diet? Uh, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, it's a low protein. It's a mostly vegan pescatarian. So why is that? Well, if you push people to do a vegan diet, you're going to get a lot of good and a lot of bad. Uh, why? Because many people are going to become malnourished. And so if you instead of a pescatarian diet, and now uh, fish contains B12, for example, uh, it contains essential fatty acids, uh, etc. And now it's much less likely that you're going to get malnourishment from this eating two, two or three times a week fish and then having otherwise a vegan diet. So I felt that uh, not only was it ideal 
diet, it will also sort of also, uh, self-regulate, meaning that you wouldn't need to think about it very much. You could just say, let me just have fish three times a week and eat a vegan diet, and I don't need to sit there and, and count too many things. And that was, that was really important. And the other uh, factors are uh, high nourishment, as I just mentioned, the B12, the, the, the essential fatty acids, but also you know the calcium, the vitamin D, uh, zinc, etc. All these things are, are, are very important uh, for nourishment. And that's, uh, I think, also a problem with uh, some of the, uh, the calorie restriction studies that by pushing the system to uh, an extreme, there was a lot of benefits, for example, in, in, in diabetes and cardiovascular disease and cancer, but then there were probably a lot of problems generated by pushing the, the, the people to uh, some, some form of malnourishment. And so, you know, th- th- that is a problem. These, the, you say calorie restriction, these are people who believe in permanently restricting their calories and, and might live on 1,700 calories permanently. So reducing what is considered normal by a very significant percentage, but they do it every day for, for forever and a day. Right. They do, this was Roy Walford uh, recommendation. And, um, and, of course, he didn't do it very much himself, right? I mean, he said he did done it, but when he did do it, in biosphere too, he was he went and did a human uh, calorie restriction uh, trial in this place in Arizona, where they were locked up essentially for two years, and that you, there you could see the effect of calorie restriction, which uh, made him extremely thin and uh, you know very low BMI, body mass index, and there is almost no doubt that that hurt him. Uh, those two years of, of this extreme diet hurt him. So you know calorie restriction. And, you know, beside the fact that the great majority of people could never do it, uh, this is eating 30% less calorie than a normal person with good health would, would eat, right? So, uh, like you said, you know, 17, 1,800 calories a day is extremely difficult. Um, and, um, and then even if you could do it, then you'll have the, as many problems that you have as you have solutions. So it's not the way to go. So um, I think it's much better to focus on uh, food composition and also in the book, I talk about, for example, a, a very specific type of time-restricted feeding. This is work by Sachin Panda and others. Uh, but uh, it, it, to me, it was also important. So time-restricted feeding basically say, how many hours a day should you eat for? Right? So should you go, as Americans now do, and many uh, countries around the world, start at 7 a.m. and go all the way to midnight? Or is that bad? And I think that if you look at the, some of the recommendations by dietitians, uh, this idea of eating five or six times a day has really helped extending the number of hours that people are eating. So when, when Panda and colleagues looked it up, people were eating for you know, 14, 15 hours a day. Uh, but now it turns out that now people are going the opposite and they're eating for six hours a day. And both have problems. You know, for example, very few people, when I go around and talk, I always get this question about the, the uh, you know, can we do time restriction, time restricted feeding? And almost nobody knows that if you go past the 12 hours, you have a major increase, for example, in gallstone formation. And if you go past, and if you skip breakfast, study after study after study, and now shown increased uh, cardiovascular disease, increased mortality. So now there's two uh, big uh, uh, problems associated with long, uh, let's say, 14, 16 hour fasting daily. Uh, but there are no problems associated with the 12-hour uh, fasting. So, well, yeah, well, so that's one of the, the recommendations of the book, 12 hours, stay within 12 hours, 8 a.m., 8 p.m., 9 a.m., 9 p.m. And that, uh, there is not a, a single study that I've seen uh, uh, that uh, suggests that this is negative. Which is very interesting. And, and it is, I think it is a problem that there is so much confusion about, uh, let's say, the 16-8 that a lot of people are doing. A lot of people in, in Silicon Valley, for example, uh, uh, skipping breakfast. And I, I've tried it, and it's actually doable. And I actually feel quite good by skipping breakfast and eating my first meal later in the morning. But as you say, there are studies that show that it isn't necessarily Good for you. And no, no, I, I suppose, no, a study is saying that it's bad for you, not necessarily yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. So there, yeah. there's evidence that shows it's actually bad for you. But nevertheless, it persists as, as one of the many options that yeah. people can, can choose to try. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is exactly the, the, uh, the idea of the book, is to say, 
because when I when I go around, I I get the question from doctors. I get the question sometimes from experts, right? And then that's when I know that that there is something fundamental missing here, right? And, and the fundamental is to really always, for example, the safety, particularly in the science community, seems to always be lacking, you know? And I always point to rapamycin. You know, my lab discovered the role of the Taurus cyskinase pathway in aging, and, and rapamycin is the drug that blocks this pathway. But yet we never used it or rarely used it because we knew it from the beginning it's just a matter of time we're going to start seeing problems with this. It's just a drug that is blocking something very fundamental for the cell in a very uncoordinated way. And yet the science community really jumped on this rapamycin as it was going to be the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the miracle drug of, of tomorrow. Then it took 10 years to start seeing this, the negative effects, the cataract formation, the hyperglycemia that it causes, the, uh, the generation of uh, sperm cells. So, yeah, so then I think that the, the safety uh, pillar is extremely, uh, is, is the most important of all, in fact, right? And, and you rarely, the excitement brings people to look more at, oh, but this study showed that the 16-8 uh, could do this, right? I say it could make you lose weight and it could lower your cholesterol level. And, and, and in the aging field, another one of the pillars uh, it, it, the, the, the one thing that we always point out is you can't look at it anymore at just what it does to one thing. You have to look at overall, is it going to make this person live to 110 healthy or is it going to increase the chance of getting to 110 healthy or not? Uh, and, and that's how the recommendations should be uh, identified. And obviously they're not. Do you think 110 is a, is a reasonable aspiration, knowing what we know, what, what you know, that it, that it is possible for a large number of people? Yes. So, you know, I, I followed in the past 10 years that Emma Morano, who got to 117, and uh, Salvatore Caruso, who got to 110 in Italy. So it's obviously these are, are very uh, rare longevity uh, records, but I think that if we now created a group of people that followed all the diet, all the recommendations, not just the dietary recommendation, then I think that um, you know we're going to get closer and closer to this 110 average lifespan for that group. We're not going to get anytime soon to 110 for the entire planet, but for the group that started listening to. Uh, the, the, I think this method and, and, and the right way of doing it and the safe way of doing it, then I think we're going to get uh, potentially there, you know, in the next uh, 30, 40 years. Do you think you need to, let, let's say someone followed pretty much your guidelines and, and, and your ideas, do you need to start really from childhood or certainly from late teens, er, early adulthood, following that regime to, to see those eventual results? Or is it never too late to start? In other words, you can start changing things in your 40s, 50s, or even 60s to, to extend your number of healthy years? Yes, it's, it's never too late to start. Our first study with the fasting-making diet, for example, uh, but also the studies with all kinds of interventions by others, uh, many of them are started uh, in middle age and uh, if not even later ages. Uh, of course, um, uh, it's also important to keep in mind that what we uh, have uh, uh, recently shown is that there are multiple uh, diets for different ages. So certainly there is a up to age 65, 70 and 65, 70 and later uh, diet. Um, so um, so it's important to, uh, to understand this, that there are completely not completely, but sort of different requirements for somebody that is uh, 50, trying to prevent uh, cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer, or, and somebody that is uh, 75. Uh, of course, the, this 75 still wants to prevent these diseases, but has other challenges like you know weight loss, uh, loss of uh, lean body mass, uh, immunosenescence, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they... Uh, uh, they're now in a position where they uh, may be as likely to be killed by a virus or, or, or an extreme heat or cold condition as they are from cancer. 
So the longevity diet, without going into all the detail, but you've essentially said it is a, a pescatarian diet, a mostly vegan diet with fish, good fish, a couple of times a week. And, and, and people low can, protein. Yeah. Low protein. High nourishment. And actually, one thing that I always get labeled uh, with is uh, eating less. And uh, in the book, I, I even put a picture saying, no, I think you should eat more. Uh, of course, you may eat a little bit less calories, but volume-wise, you should increase the volume of the food, the amount of food you eat. And of course, I give specific uh, examples uh, of how to do that. So, for example, you know, because uh, the, the Italian cuisine is is uh, one of the most popular around the world, and around the world, in Italy too. Now, uh, you now see these dishes of pasta, right? As you see in Asia, these dishes of, of rice, right? So it doesn't really matter whether it's pasta or rice. And that's really uh, the, the, one of the, the, the things that has to be eliminated. So in the book I talk about, you know, you have to eliminate this 150 gram of, of dish covered with pasta and go to 50 grams. Keep the pasta in there. You know, don't, don't, that's another mistake that people, you go from one problem to the, the opposite, which is uh, eliminate completely the, the carbs. No, the 50 grams, I think, pe- keep people happy. Uh, and as it keeps me happy, but then you have 300 grams of, of garbanzo beans and 150 grams of, of mixed greens and, and a lot of olive oil on top of it. Now, this went from a very unhealthy, uh, empty um, calorie uh, dish to something that really takes care of all your needs and it fills your stomach. That's another important thing. The stomach, as, as we know, for example, from bariatric surgery, you know, makes somebody's stomach smaller. Why is that? Well, because the, the stomach sends signals to your brain and tells the brain, I've had enough. And, and this probably happens both volume-wise and nourishment-wise. If you give the right things, if the right nu- nutrients are, are uh, reach the system, then the, the system uh, recognizes that and says, um, okay, and gives a um, stop eating uh, signal itself. So, yeah, so volume and also nourishment, these are, are very important in preventing somebody from from overeating, and you know, once you you, you had a lot of food, uh, there's also no room for for uh, bad food, which you might be thinking about. So let's talk about the fasting mimicking diet then, and how that diet fits in with your bigger picture of a, a longevity diet. Is the FMD something that you still recommend mostly for at risk people, or is it something that all of us, you think, should be using every couple of months, maybe a couple of times a year, to supplement what we're doing every day. The fasting making diet, I say in my book, it should be done when you need to do it. Uh, why is that? Well, we have no indication of any negative side effects, but you always have to think the, about the worst case scenario, and um, you know, and even with minor ones, you want to say, uh, how many times does this person need to do it, and why? And, and until, of course, you know, once 10 million people have done it and we can show that people that have been on the, uh, on the fasting making diet live 10, ti- 10 years longer, then okay, then everybody should do it as much as frequently as possible. But um, so, f- and in the book I say, well, if you are somebody that is obese, has high cholesterol and high blood pressure, uh, then you probably need to do it once a month until you move to a better range or a different range. Because then I say, if you're overweight and you do it and you have two risk factors, then you do it uh, once every two months and, and down from there, right? So all the way to once every six months, if you're an athlete, you're a 32-year-old athlete that um, has a pescatarian diet uh, and otherwise follows almost everything that I said uh, in, in the first part of the book, uh, then, yeah, that person probably only needs to do it a couple of times a year. So let's address some of the questions that, as you know, I've done the fasting mimicking diet many, many times over the last few years since your clinical trial that I was part of, and that was 2013. I get the same questions over and over again. Yes, that long ago, 2013. Yeah. Um, I get the same questions. And one is, can you create your own fasting mimicking diet? Can you use the foods in your refrigerator or that you buy at the market to try to, to mimic the diet that you have created that comes in little white boxes and it has day one, two, three, four, five, and it's very simple. You just eat what's in the box. And, and that's the only FMD that, that I've ever done but people want to try and let's face it you've got to pay for the fasting mimicking diet and it costs a few hundred dollars can you create it yourself 
Uh, no. And, uh, and, the, and the reason you can, I mean, when I wrote the Italian version of the book, I made a big mistake. And the big mistake was you could do it with the kit, with the prolon uh, diet, or you can go to somebody that knows what they're doing, and, and they can make, uh, of course, I exclude the make it at home. But I said, you know, you can go to somebody, and they can explain to you uh, how it is that you do your own fasting-making diet. And then we started getting the emails from patients, lawyers, and doctors, right? And all of them said, I mean, of course, the ones that benefited from whatever improvised version didn't say anything. We heard from the ones that didn't benefit. Why? Because now if you take a medicine as powerful as the fasting-making diet or, or certain intervention that is as powerful as that, some, something that by day four or five will revo- revolutionize the way your brain functions because then now it goes from using sugar to using ketone bodies. And the way your heart functions, now it turns into a fatty acid burning mode, and the way your stem cell functions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, should that be uh, left to somebody cooking uh, and, and picking things at home? No, it cannot. And, and there is many, many reasons for that. So we had people uh, that went to the emergency room that improvised the, the, the diet at home. People that, um, you know, went to their doctor saying, I did this, I'm not sure, you know, or this nutritionist told me to do this, I did it, and now this happened to me. And uh, so many, many of these cases. And also lawyers, and I started hearing from people saying, you better tell everybody to stop doing this because you're going to start uh, seeing even bigger problems soon enough. And, and, and there was one. Luckily, I immediately, months and months before, said, stop. I mean, bad idea that I had, stop. But then there was a, a neurologist in Italy following a multiple sclerosis patient. And, uh, and he had the bad idea to tell this lady, go home and do three weeks of uh, fasting. Or, you know, I, I'm not sure what kind of fasting he recommended her to do, and the lady died. Um, and so that was, uh, the, you know, I think that the, the confirmation that, uh, you know, why did she die, nobody knows. But for sure is that taking this powerful intervention and, and allowing somebody in a hotel room or wherever she was uh, to do it like that with, with no supervision and, uh, and in this case, such a, a length. And that's another thing you can control. Once you tell people, um, once you give people the ability to do something at home, you completely lose control of the way it's done. You know, it doesn't matter what you say. It matters how they interpret it and how they, and they may say, oh, but if I do it for this, I can do it for that. You know, if I do it for five days, I'm sure I can do it for 12. And, uh, and that's what you have to consider. And that's where the disasters start occurring and um, um, but also in the way it is composed, in the mistakes. Uh, somebody, a person out there is not a pharmacist, so they don't know. Uh, you know, how many times I can count the number of times where I told journalists 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day, and, and I can count the number of times when they came back and say, "What well, did you mean, uh, 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 weight of protein or weight of food that contains protein?" Now. <laughs> Between the weight of protein and the weight of food that contains protein, there is often, if it's vegan, there is a tenfold difference, right? So you see how easy it is for, and, and this was journalists. For misinformation to spread. Misunderstanding right. and, and just uh, uh, saying, is food, how could it hurt me? And that's where the responsibility then comes back to us. And I don't mean in a legal way, but I also mean in a, in a personal way, is it worth uh, you know, saving some money and then making people save some money and then say, well, by the way, I didn't tell you, some of, some of you are going to get hurt, but that's okay. You're going to save money doing this way. And also, don't forget that the fasting making diet, the average American, and, and, and uh, you know, Europe, it's a little bit different, but, but certainly in America, the average middle-class American will, have, will spend about $160 per five day. And I think now the diet is uh, 220 for five days. So the difference, if you do it three times a year, it's, uh, uh, what, it's a $60 difference three times a year. It'll be $180 difference per year. Uh, you know, and this is uh, the reported official overall consumption for you know, coffees and, and everything you, you eat uh, or drink for five days. 
So caution is the watchword. You don't recommend anything but the official fasting mimicking diet. And even for those people who, who use the proper boxes and the proper diet, they still need to take medical advice before they start to do it because there are several groups of people for whom this just is not appropriate. Yeah, no, not any more medical advice. What they do now, and, and, and by the way, I, uh, I don't make a penny out of any of this, so uh, I don't take consulting. Um, all the shares uh, that I have in the company will go to Create Cures Foundation uh, that I started a few years ago. Uh, so, you know, certainly I'm, I'm not saying any of this so that I can benefit my pocket. But uh, now there is a, a screening method so that the company screens people and says uh, to establish are they healthy or not. And if they're healthy, then they just basically have an opportunity to talk to uh, a nutritionist and that's it. If they're not healthy, then the doctor needs to be involved and then, you know, uh, there is all kinds of, of uh, exclusions. And, of course, there is exclusions even if you are healthy. For example, if you're anorexic, uh, if you are uh, over age of 70, uh, if you, uh, uh, yeah, weight, if your, your BMI is too low, et cetera. So these are some of the exclusions for healthy people. But then the other ones, of course, are going to be up to the doctors that, that are uh, um, following the patients. Actually, you mentioned an exclusion if you're over 70. It brings me to uh, actually a question that I've had from a listener to this podcast and who heard your first interview with me, Christopher Dunham. He listens in the UK, asks a question about the diet related to autophagy. And maybe you could just first of all explain what autophagy is and its significance within the diet. And his question or his concern is that there could be negative consequences for older people. And he wonders whether there is a cutoff point for the FMD, especially as it applies to autophagy and how it affects the body and especially older people. Yes, the um, of course, uh, uh, fasting mimicking diets or fasting are probably the most powerful way to activate autophagy. And the autoph autophagy is the process uh, activated in a cell to basically eat itself. And so during this process, uh, all kinds of organelles like mitochondria can be broken down, but also other components of the cell. And essentially what the cell is trying to do is to get rid of things that get rid of weight, but also use that weight for fuel, right? I always use the, the analogy with the... Uh, uh, wood-burning uh, locomotive that runs out of fuel and is going to run out of fuel because it doesn't have any more wood to burn and uses its own components, its chairs and the walls that are uh, made of wood to be burned and to get to the next uh, train station. So that's what autophagy is. You know, eat yourself, uh, self-components within the cell uh, to make it to the next uh, uh, food uh, um, availability moment. And uh, now, yeah, the set, could it hurt uh, old people? Uh, absolutely. I think it could it probably benefit old people and it could hurt old people. And, um, and so now we're trying to figure out in what conditions and to what extent can you do it in an older person. For example, we have, soon enough, we have an Alzheimer's trial starting. And so we, we, for the Alzheimer's trial, we're, we're now modifying the fasting making diet and we're also uh, considering an in-between diet, something that will follow uh, the the fasting making diet, and um, yeah, so those are going to be the uh, so for elderly, it has to be part of a clinical trial uh, and it has to be very well um, assembled uh, before you you take a 85 year old and, and put this person on a, on a low calorie, low protein, et cetera, diet. Christopher also asks a question about lowering of IGF-1 levels. You've referred to IGF-1 already, again, which is something that happens over the five days of the uh, the FMD and, and continues. And I remember from the clinical trial that uh, testing of my blood showed that for a significant period after the, the five day, your IGF-1 is at a, a lower level, I suppose, hence the periodic nature of the fasting diet that you come back a few months later your IGF will have risen again but then you you knock it down They're just broadly explaining what happens he asks whether low IGF one levels can actually be negative and and what is the what is the cutoff point what is optimum in terms of IGF one do we know that the uh, low IGF one can be negative 
Uh, of course, there are um, there is a systemic circulating IGF-1, and there is local production of, of IGF-1. So in many, many cases, the local production is more important than the systemic. So, and, and those are two different things. And um, now, uh, probably even the systemic, um, there is some role for the systemic. It, it's probably not a, a great role because the Laron, the people that we follow, and also the mice that have almost no IGF-1, um, in fact, the, the mouse that lives the longest, uh, uh, lifespan extension-wise, is a, a severely IGF-1 deficient mouse, uh, and this deficiency is due to growth hormone or growth hormone receptor deficiency. So, and the people that we follow in Ecuador that have extremely low IGF-1, circulating IGF-1, they don't get cancer. I mean, they rarely get cancer, diabetes, etc. And and you've uh, you've been down there and you you've. Um, uh, you've studied them yourself, yeah. And, and so um, the the problem is probably much more related to not having enough IGF one where the IGF one is needed. And and our suspicion, even though we haven't carefully looked at it, is these mice and people they have the local IGF one where it's needed, and and they make enough to to take care of the problems. So uh, that said. Um, do you want to have a very low protein diet uh, uh, and have even lower IGF one? IGF one goes down with aging naturally, um, and so we uh, suspect, based on our work, that that's not a good idea. In fact, we suspect that you might have to increase protein intake a little bit. You know, go from a low to a moderate level of protein intake as you get to sixty five and seventy, uh, just because the system. The, the circulating IGF-1 is already so low by then that um, by having a very low-protein diet, um, you may make the, this even lower, and maybe uh, to most people this this is potentially a problem. And it may have to do with the systemic IGF-1, but it may also have to do with uh, the local, what's called autocrine, paracrine IGF-1, the, the IGF-1 you make, let's say, in the brain to stimulate the growth of uh, neural stem cells or in the muscle you know, to stimulate the growth of, of muscle cells. Of course, IGF-1 isn't something that most of us can monitor. It's not a, a test that's ordered by your doctor. Oh, no, it is. It's your annual physical for most people. Uh, you, you might have your triglycerides and your, your cholesterol, but on a, a standard test, I mean, you, you can do it. I mean, clearly Some you, you do, can do it, but it's not standard. But Yeah, but, but uh, almost every doctor, if you ask them, they can easily get your IGF-1. This is uh, most labs around the world now, do this. So, for example, we had many, many uh, journalists uh, that wanted to do the uh, the before and after, and we never heard of somebody coming back and say I couldn't find a, a, a doctor that that could get me that. So it means and this was from Australia to to the UK to Italy to the US. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, but you, the, I suppose my point is you you need to ask for it. it it's not yes. a routine test. That no, no, done. no. It, it, well, for most people, and it is routine. I've seen it included in some various, maybe like more sophisticated clinics. But I would say, yeah, probably the, the great majority of clinics uh, and doctors will not include a GF1 among your standard uh, biochemical tests. Yeah. One other thing I want to talk about from the book, and I know we're, we're running short of time, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to this because it really fascinates me. You don't like labels, and you think people can be confused by, let, let's say, the use of the phrase intermittent fasting. You talk about, and we've talked about periodic fasting with the fasting mimicking diet, the, the confusion that is caused there. Some, some of the others that we, we can get to, the Mediterranean diet, which is often quoted but people maybe don't really fully understand what, what they're referring to when they talk about a Mediterranean diet. So let, let's tackle intermittent fasting versus periodic fasting first. Yeah, so th- these do tremendous damage, right? Because it's one thing to not know and realize you don't know. It's very different if you think you know and you don't know. Right? Because, for example, with intermittent fasting, it's a word that now all journalists are using and people on the street now uh, uh, think they understand it. And of course, it means nothing, right? Because it can go from not eating for eight hours, right, to not eating for 60 days, right? So what, what does that mean? I mean, that's how it's being used, right? Because uh, in our case, for example, it has nothing to do with intermittent fasting, obviously. It's done on a need base, meaning if you need to do it, it could be that this year you do it 10 times, and next year you do it two times. Uh, so there's nothing intermittent about that. 
it's like a medicine. You use it when you need it. And, uh, but also if you keep out this periodic fasting, to use the word intermittent fasting to have, let's say, the six-hour fasting period and the one day and the five-two, it's really grouping together completely different things. For example, it's not for the purpose of, of ge- getting into a ketogenic mode, so a, a, a place where the body is starting to break down fat, mostly visceral fat, which generate fatty acids and, and ketone bodies. You need a couple of days, right? So, you know, if you don't wait two days with either a fasting making diet or no food, that's not going to happen. And also f- to start breaking down cells, cellular component, that needs a couple of days uh, to get there. So it's very important to stop using these words that are umbrella words that don't mean anything and start saying, well, what do you mean? You know, uh, are you talking about time restricted feeding? Yes. And which one? Because some of it, as I just mentioned, is bad. And some of it is probably pretty good. So 12 hours is clearly very good. And 18 hours is clearly not a good idea. And, and four hours is, of fasting is clearly also not a good idea or, or, eight, or seven hours. Um, so, yeah, so I think that it, I know that <laughs> a lot of journalists like to keep it simple, but that's just tremendous damage uh, by, by doing this. And the other one is Mediterranean diet. I mean, find a person around the world that doesn't, hasn't heard this word and find a person, a journalist around the world that understands, as I point out in the book, uh, that the, the effect of the meta-analysis, so the, the review of all the studies done, shows that even if you adopt a, a, a true Mediterranean diet, which most people don't know what it means, the effects on diseases are between 6% and 13%. Uh, so that means that uh, by adopting that diet, you'll have minimal uh, effects compared to whatever diet that, that, you know, that particular control population might have. Now, it's a good diet because, you know, 10% is still very good, you know, and it's remarkable if you could just get the, the whole nation to be 10% healthier, right? So the, I'm not saying it, but it's certainly not what we see from and what we expect from our aging studies. For example, we have Ecuadorians that never get cancer or diabetes or the monkey studies with color restriction, which we mentioned earlier, where diabetes went from 60% in the control group to zero in the in the color restricted group or the cardiovascular disease and cancer were reduced by 50 percent right so uh you know these are obviously realities now which we can achieve so by using words like intermittent fasting or mediterranean diet we are really blocking people from identifying what is it that in fact and another example is like the Okinawans, the historic Okinawans versus J- Japanese versus American uh, risk for disease, right? In, in many cases where there was cardiovascular disease or, or so- certain cancer, there were, there were three to tenfold differences, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so the question is, how do we get everybody to have these benefits, which uh, these are remarkable. Even if you get halfway there, you might have a twofold change in your risk for cancer. Uh, all these words then are noise preventing people from um, getting to the, uh, to the right uh, diet. And the other word, one other word that, uh, or maybe it's an expression, uh, everything in moderation, is another one. You're smiling already. It's something, and I've got to admit, I'm quite guilty of this. I use the word moderation quite a lot. I say moderation in diet and exercise, uh, not moderation in cigarette smoking. No cigarette smoking is good, but generally exercise and diet. Why don't you like the word moderation? Because people like the Mediterranean diet, moderation is used to, for people to do whatever it is that they want to do. Because, and this is why in the book I talk about a bagel. If you ask people, well, how many calories do you think it's in a bagel? They'll say, I don't know, 100 calories. And so, in fact, it is between 300 and 800, depending on what you put on top of it. So it's three times to eight times as much or, or something like that. And so, you know, in your view, that bagel is, of course, 100 calories. And you're thinking, if I'm having, you know, uh, 2,000 calories should be what I should be eating or 2,200 or whatever, where they can have 22 of these a day, right? And, and you start thinking like that. And that, of course, in your head becomes moderation because, in fact, that's a recommendation. You should have 2,000 calories. So that is a problem with, with words like that because they really allow people 
to do eat whatever it is that they and they feel is moderation and the moderation is based on their understanding of you know calories content etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, and you'd be shocked when you ask people about their knowledge uh, how many people uh, they have a very little knowledge of, of what food contains. And I mean, I'm not saying it, it, it's understandable. They're not experts. This is not, I mean, if you ask me about, uh, um, you know, a, a, an engine of, of a car, I, I mean, you know, I know very little and, and it's not my job. And, and this is why I don't pretend to, uh, to know the details of uh, what it contains and how it works. And uh, so I think that, um, we uh, we need to move into simple. I mean, I, I don't want to make it complicated. I mean, the book is, tries to be as simple as possible, right? But uh, and and in Italy, um, I mean, the one comment that I heard from everybody is like how simple it was. It was like there is no doubts about what you're saying. And there's also you don't need to go around with a scale or with uh, uh, or with a manual. I mean, once you got it, you got it, and 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 that you can maintain it. Uh, and centenarians have had similar diets, and there were no manuals. Um, uh, so, so I think, yeah, uh, it's important to um, to stay away from these words that are easy to say to mean nothing. And you say, and I've read the book, and it, it is a great book, and it, it is relatively simple. I think the, the anecdotes that go along with the, the scientific information kind of melt together and help you understand what, what you're trying to say. And you also acknowledge that it, it isn't just diet, it's, it's exercise, and an element of whatever you want to call it, whether it's spirituality or spirituality blending with religion, whatever people are happy with. They are components that you're not an expert in, but you acknowledge that they play a role in our longevity yes for for exercise i'm not an expert but i i went and looked at the data and the studies and the large studies and i cite uh, you know my the book is uh, of course i use the little numbers because i know that most people are not going to look at the citations but you know there are probably a couple hundred citations in there including the, those on exercise and so i went and, and also for exercise looked at what is the common denominator how can i use the five pillars to also address the exercise part, and I'm not an expert, but let, let me let the expert talk. And there, you know, it came out that 150 minutes a week of exercise, uh, having maybe 10% of it trying to be pushing the system, not to the limit, but close to the limit. Uh, so let's say 15 minutes a week where you're really pushing yourself. High intensity stuff. High intensity, exactly. I mean, you know, of course, high intensity for a 70 year old is different from high intensity for a 20 year old. And uh, yeah, so I, I try to, and also I try to look at, again, the safety, the damage, something that you don't see very often. You know, what, what does it mean to go on a bike versus swimming versus running? And, and you know, and using some of the pillar system, I said, well, you're probably the best way, and also talking to people that are experts, the best is the bike. Uh, you know, biking really seems to, to have all the benefits and not much of the detrimental effects. It's you know, easier running, on your joints. It's much, e- much easier on your joints. You really don't have this, uh, this uh, you know, continuous impacts. And, um, and uh, yeah, so, so those are the, some of the things that, the, that I felt it was uh, fairly straightforward. And, you know, after a year and a half that the book has been out in Italy, I had zero complaints from experts. I mean, I, that was, I was really surprised. I thought I was going to get a lot of complaints <laughs> from, from a lot of people. But I say technically... Uh, amazingly, I, I received zero complaints from doctors, and I'm not making this up, and, and zero complaints from kinesiologists or experts of either exercise or diet saying, well, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i sure there is, there is somebody who's going to complain at some point, maybe in the United States or, or the UK, I'll have my, my chance to hear the complaints, but... <laughs> Uh, that hasn't happened in Italy, so and, I, uh, I feel pretty good about that. That's good to hear. And just on exercise, you recommend an hour a day of uh, quite brisk walking on a regular basis? Yeah, so on top of the 150 minutes of exercise, I basically, um, you know, all over the world notice how people are not doing what they're supposed to do with their body anymore. So, for example, at the airport, everybody is gets on the, on the uh, escalator and uh, and so I think it's uh, uh, you know very important to just do simple things like always take the stairs, and every day when and this includes Italy or the U.S., people say, well, let's go to the closest possible place to have lunch or to have coffee, 
And, and the, what they should be saying is, let's pick the place that's the furthest, the furthest re- in a reasonable uh, distance. So, you know, 15 minutes away, it's actually a very good place, you know. Pick a place that's 15 minutes, two places, like a coffee shop and a restaurant, and go there twice a, a day. You just walk an hour, and that will happen all the time. Another thing that I, I recommend is have something at home uh, that you can exercise with. You know, so I have a stationary bike. That's very important, you know, because sometimes I do get an opportunity to take a bike like, you know, yesterday and do two hours. But, you know, people are busy. They have children. They have all work. And, and if you have it at home and you have a stationary bike and you have one that you can tighten up and, and, and make it like, like as if you were going uphill, and then you have almost no excuses. You can... You know, work and do that for 30 minutes every other day. So that's important. So, yeah, but, but the one hour a day uh, walking, it's, uh, I think, very important. You know, stay active like that and you feel better. And, and really, there's very little wasting of, of, of your time. I think, you know, and most people can do it. Walter, as ever, this has been fascinating. There is so much more of, of the detail in the book and I, I do recommend it. You have mentioned this uh, briefly. All the proceeds go to, to charities, including Create Cures Foundation, which is the organization that you started. Yes. Uh, uh, as for the diet, the book also is 100 percent. At least my uh, royalties, 100 percent go to the foundation. And, you know, we start, already started uh, giving them away. And, uh, in fact, uh, one of the studies we just funded, uh, we're going to help fund this one on uh, prevention of, uh, um, you know, in patients that have BRCA1, BRCA2, this mutation that causes a very high Angelina Jolie type uh, the, the mutation that she has. And uh, uh, the Alzheimer trial is another one that we're going to help fund. We have one on multiple sclerosis. So we have about 10 clinical trials right now, and, and most of them in some way are going to benefit from at least a little bit of the funds uh, generated by this, uh, by this book. Yeah. Professor Walter Longa, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Good to see you. And on the show notes page for this episode, I will include links to Walter's book, Walter's Facebook page, which has a lot of information on it, the Create Cures Foundation website as well, and some of the other references from this interview. We're at the Live Long and Master Aging website. We use the acronym LAMA, so that's the LAMAPodcast.com, double L-A-M-A podcast.com. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at Llama Podcast. Many thanks for listening.